So hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this session from our partner, uh, Savient. Uh, today, it's going to be uh, uh, the Enterprise Identity Cloud uh, from Savient, and it will be more a, of a demonstration of the interface. Uh, I am Roger Wallet. I am the director of the security uh, and networking practice at Navipo. Been here for uh, more than 17 years, and I would like to remind you uh, that uh, you can post your question in the uh, private ch in the chat that you have on on, on, the, on your windows. And if we don't have time to answer those questions at the end of the session, you can always go to the the boot uh, from Savient and and Navipo. And we can answer your questions from there uh, if we uh, can answer it during the session. So we have today Ankar uh, that uh, will be uh, he's a uh, senior solution art engineer uh, for large scale implementation with over 20 years of experience in the IT industry, primarily in the IAM solution. Hank has mastered the business strategy development, solution design, team development, and technology transformation. With his experience, Hank has not only the technical skill required, but also the project management expertise to deliver security projects. In addition, in these fields, Hank holds 28 uh, cybersecurity certifications, allowing him to offer his uh, client solutions adapted to uh, all type of business needs. So uh, here we go. Let's look at this presentation. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Hank Carr. I am the Senior Solution Engineer for Savient based south of Ottawa. What we're going to do today is take a quick tour of the Savient Enterprise Identity Cloud. I suspect that some or many of you were in my colleague Francis's session earlier today. And he will have talked to you about the five pillars of the Savient Enterprise Identity Cloud. They are Identity Governance and Administration, IGA, which is the foundation of our platform. Privileged Access Management, uh, our cloud PAM product is uh, one of the leaders in PAM uh, and will cover your full stack. Application Access Governance brings fine-grained access and entitlement control to applications where none exists natively. Third-party Access Governance gives you control over your partners and suppliers and even customers who need access to applications within your network or in your portal. And finally, Data Access Governance, which will go out and find privileged information in your data uh, and assign uh, governance to that data in place uh, to provide additional security around your data. All of these modules are tied together by the platform. They were all developed in-house. None of them were bought and bolted on. So they grew organically out of the same code base. And they're all tied together with our Iten uh, intelligent identity warehouse and our advanced analytics, which span the platform. So there's no need for you to go out and buy an analytic product. Analytics just comes with the platform. So let's go and take a look at the Savient Enterprise Identity Cloud. The Savient Enterprise Identity Cloud is a single unified platform that you use to govern identities, privileged access, and uh, the other modules. All of the functionality in the Savient Enterprise Identity Cloud is accessed through a single unified user interface. So whether you are a user, a manager, a certifier, or an administrator, you're going to log into the same user interface. We're logged in here as Edward, who is a regular employee. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, we have a profile menu. The profile menu lets you adjust your environment. One of the important things for us here in Canada is the fact that it lets us switch to French if we choose to do that. And there are actually, uh, I believe, 16 languages that we support. So you can see we're in French now. The interface follows the language of your browser. So if your browser is set to French, when you log into the Enterprise Identity Cloud, the user interface will be in French. 
I'm using an English browser, so it follows the browser language. And I'm going to go back and choose it uh, back to English here. And it's just that easy. You can switch back and forth. You can switch to German. You can switch to Spanish. You can switch to whatever language you want. It's very easy. Next to the profile menu is the application menu. Because Edward, who we're logged in as, is a regular end user, the only application that he has access to is the home screen. But you'll see when we log in as a manager or as the administrator that we will have additional applications here. Up in the upper left-hand corner is the action menu. That gives us all of the actions that we can perform. And these actions are persona dependent. So as a regular user like Edward, we have a few actions here. If we log in as a manager, we have more. If we log in as an administrator, we have the full menu. On the home screen, you have a welcome tile right here at the top, which has quick action tiles on it. Right now, because we're logged in as a user, this user doesn't have to do certifications. He doesn't have to do approvals. The only thing that he sees here is uh, how many uh, requests he has pending. And then down below, we have featured or pinned um, actions. So we can request access. Uh, we can look at our existing access. We can change our password. So all of those sorts of things that are regular everyday functions are going to appear here for the user. Now, if Edward wants to make a request for new functionality, what we would do is we would go in here. And for example, let's request access for Oracle ERP. So what we want to do is we want to add some roles and I'm going to add, uh, let's pick a couple of these manager and revenue manager. So let's pick those. Now, what Savian is going to do is we are going to analyze this request to see if it creates policy issues for us. And in this case, it has actually created a separation of duties violation, and we're bringing that forward right away. So what we're doing is we're micro certifying every request to make sure that it does not greatly increase the threat that's posed by this user and letting the user reconsider that request because it is creating a separation of duties violation. Now, in this case, if we really need this, we can say uh, Carol is going on vacation and I'm covering. And down below here, you'll see that it's calling out the two uh, the two entitlements that are creating this separation of duties violation, the Hyperion L1 and the Hyperion L2. I need this for two weeks while Carol is away. We can acknowledge and then submit the request. Now, what we've done is we've submitted a request that's generating a separation of duties violation. There we go. So now we've submitted this request. Now, if we go back to our home screen now, it'll take a moment for that to actually catch up, but we will see that we have one request here. Now, if we log out as Edward, and log back in as his manager, Margaret. You'll see that Margaret has a few more uh, of these pinned uh, function tiles down here. In the application menu, she now has attestations, which is certification campaigns. And you'll see that she has some uh, pending approvals and some pending certifications. If we click on the action menu, you see that there are a lot more items in the action menu. Uh, so all of these things are persona dependent. They're dependent on your role in the organization. They're dependent on your role within Savian. Now, if we go in and look at those pending requests, the last one on the list down here is going to be the one that Edward just submitted, which created that SOD violation. 
and you'll see right up at the top here that it's calling that out. So rather than allowing you to submit a request and approve a request without knowing that that's going to create a problem, and then having to run a tool later on that goes out and looks for those separation of duties violations, we're pulling them right up front right away so that you know that it's happening and you can deal with it. You can put mitigating controls in place or you can go ahead and approve it with a note saying we're going to let this happen for two weeks so that Edward can act for Carol. So it's designed to eliminate the possibility that you create those policy violations without knowing that it's happening. So you're aware of what's going on. The next thing that I want to talk about is uh, let's log in as the administrator. And what that's going to do is that's going to open up all of the menus for us. So when you deploy Savient into your environment, the first thing you're going to do is connect it to your uh, HR source of truth or the main source of identities in your environment. Then you will connect it into your directory, which in most cases is Active Directory, and it will start to pull in account and entitlement information from Active Directory. You then connect it to your endpoints, which can be endpoint applications, it can be cloud-based applications, it can be cloud infrastructure services. So if you wanted to manage entitlements in your AWS account, you can do that. So if we go and look at the users, so what I've done is I've clicked on the admin app in the app menu, that's going to pull up the admin uh, app. So now we can go and look at users. And if we pick a user, let's choose Connor Hammersmith. So if we click on Connor, what we're doing is we're looking at Connor Hammersmith's identity in the identity warehouse. And you can see what we've done is we've pulled in all of the tombstone information about him from HR, uh, who he is, what his title is, who he works for, what his job code is, what his cost center is, where he works. All of the tombstone information about him is here pulled in from the various sources. We offer you a number of additional attributes. By default, uh, we offer 65 additional attributes, but that's not a hard number. That's just what we do by default. And these additional pieces of information, these custom attributes can be pulled in from anywhere. They can be pulled in from your HR system. They can be pulled in from Active Directory. They can be pulled in from your endpoint systems. Uh, and you can use any piece of information that is in here in the identity record to make decisions. So as you're bringing someone in, if they have a custom attribute here that's job code, for example, and their job code is 1A, and you want to put them into a group called employees underscore 1A in Active Directory, you can do that. All you do is you, you refer to that custom attribute that you've populated in your onboarding rules. And we can see all of the accounts that belong to this user. So he's got a number of accounts here. You can see that one of these is PeopleSoft. So if we click on into PeopleSoft, we'll see information about his PeopleSoft account. So here's all the information about his PeopleSoft account. What's really cool here is you can see the entitlement hierarchy. And what this has done is it has pulled in the entitlement hierarchy for this identity from PeopleSoft. And you can see that we can drill down all the way down into this thing and control access to individual fields. So if, for example, you have a group of users that you want to be able to access a particular screen, but for privacy reasons, you don't want them to access a particular field, you can choose here to hide that field. You can choose to 
let them look at the field but not change it or you can choose to let them change it. So we provide very fine grained access control deep down into those large ERP uh, type systems. Now, once we've got that identity, the question becomes, how do we get them onboarded? How do we provision the entitlements that we want them to have? And it has been in the legacy uh, IGA solutions, it has always been that the connector and the rule logic were attached together. So you needed a specific connector for every endpoint. And the legacy IGA solutions will talk about how many hundreds of connectors they have. Savient, we've got a little over 300 out of the box connectors. But what we've done is we've decoupled our connector from the rules. What that means is that the connector is just a connector and the rules actually reside separately within Savient. So for systems like Novell Identity Manager, we don't have a connector for Novell Identity Manager. And our competitors would tell you, oh, that's a problem. They don't have a connector for Novell Identity Manager. But Novell Identity Manager is just an LDAP solution. It uses LDAP. So what we do is we use our generic LDAP connector that will connect to any LDAP system. Now we have multiples of generic connectors that let us connect to just about anything. And not only do we have those out of the box connectors and we have the generic connectors, but we also have robo robotic process automation and we have a thing that we call identity bot. And those can be used to connect to homegrown or legacy applications that have no APIs. You can train the robotic process automation or you can train the identity bot to log in, navigate to the fields that you want to populate or pull information out of and run those applications as though we had an API, but using those robots, right? So we make it very easy for you to manage applications and we connect to virtually everything. So the next thing that we want to look at is uh, what the rules look like. So let's find the rules here, they're higher up. There we go. Our rules and much of our platform is designed to be configuration, not code. So generally, you're not going to need to hire programmers to try to make Savient work. It just works. And it's designed to be business friendly and to allow business analysts to do operations that in the past with the legacy IGA products, you would have needed a programmer to do. So let's look in here for a rule. Let's pull up one of the playbook rules. So here we go. So here's a playbook rule. So you can see here that this says, if user cost center equals 36,100, and user job code equals 45,500, uh, then create account on system, assign SAV role, role manager. So these things are very easy to understand. They're English sounding and they're very easy to write as well. So we can go in here, click on the editor, and you'll see the rule is spelled out for you here. So if the user cost center equals 36,100, just as we saw above, and the user job code equals 45,500, then take these actions. And the actions are system account assigned. So that's uh, creating an account for the user. System sav role, role manager. So we've actually assigned them the sav role of manager because they have the 45,500, uh, which says that they're a manager. And so we can create these rules very easily. Let's go back and look at a different rule. So if we look at this second one here, the, the first role assigns the SAV role role manager, but you'll see the second role here, which is just a regular user, doesn't assign the role end user. So let's go in and do that. So if we edit this role, uh, sorry, this rule, I had role on the brain there. 
So now you'll see down here, we're assigning them the enterprise role of consultant. We're giving them an Active Directory account and we're making them a member of this group, security POC team. But we want to assign them the SAV role and user. So if we go in here and say, we want to assign system SAV role, the system several. Oh, I'm in the wrong spot here. I'm going to be down here. I had clicked on the wrong box. Several, there we go. And we want to assign them the end user role assign. So that's it. It's that easy. So if a business analyst realizes that one of these rules is wrong, they should have assigned a role. They can just go in here. They can make the change. They can save the rule, submit it for approval. It goes through the approval process and it becomes live. And now all of the users are added to that role. So it's designed to be doable by an average business analyst. So you don't need a programmer to help with these things. Now, rules obviously are cool. If we go, we can see that we have our user change rules. So the, the technical rules are our birthright rules, our user onboarding rules. And then what we have here is our user change rules. So this is the mover lever rules. And you can see down here for the lever rule, if user status key is updated and the user status key equals zero. So if they've gone from user status key one to user status key zero, then disable user and deprovision access. And in all cases, these rules are modifiable. So if you don't want to deprovision the access, if you just want to disable it, you can. If you want to assign their entitlement to someone else. So for example, if they have access to a share and that share has documents on it that say their manager or someone else might need access to immediately after they leave, you can set the rule to assign that to an alternate user. And you can specify who that assignment user is in the user record and if you don't have one specified, it automatically assigns to the manager. So these rules are designed to be very flexible, right? Now, the next thing that we need to look at is we need to look at the workflows. And the workflows are really the backbone of how Savient works. And we get questions about workflows all the time because they're challenging to write. Workflows can be very challenging to write. So let's look uh, at one level manager approval. So one of the things that Savient does really well is that we, as we detach the rules from the connectors so that the rule applies to any user who meets the conditions. The workflows are similar. You don't have to have a work workflow for each endpoint or a workflow for each type of user. There are lots of things in the average IGA deployment that need a single level user uh, approval. So, uh, sorry, a single level manager approval. So I want access to a share, my manager approves, I get access. I want access to an application. My manager approves, I get access to that application. The nice thing about Savient is that the one level manager approval workflow can be applied to anything that requires a one level manager approval. So if we look at what this one uh, level, I always struggle with this, one level manager workflow looks like, it's, built in a graphic editor, which makes it nice and easy. And again, it's designed for business analysts to be able to do this so that you don't need a programmer. So you can see here, this is the one level manager approval. And what happens here is you start up at the top. So you have a start box, then you have a manager's approval and you can notify the manager that they have an approval uh, that they need to deal with. You can notify the requester that it has been assigned to the manager. And you can also prompt the manager after a period of time has passed and that approval has not been done that he has an approval to do. And you'll see coming out the bottom here, we have approve, 
we have reject and we have escalate. So if we approve, we go to approve, we provision the requested access or we approve the requested access and we end. And if it's uh, rejected, then it goes to reject and we end. So the workflows are really easy to understand. But what's really cool is how easy they are to create. So if we want to create our own workflow, let's create a new workflow. And the example that I will always use is uh, we want a, a manager's approval and we want an escalation if the manager doesn't approve to the manager's manager. And then we want a resource owner approval. So we have two levels with escalation. So what we wanna do is we wanna take a start box here. We'll drag the start box onto the screen. We need a, a manager's approval. Where is the manager's approval? Uh, task manager approval right here. And then we're going to grant access and we're going to reject access and we're going to end. So at this point, it looks very similar to the one that we just looked at. So we're going to connect the start box here into the manager's approval. Now, what we wanted to do was we wanted to have the resource owner also have an approval. So we're going to need to go in here and we're going to need to find the resource owner. So there we go. All right, so now we have a resource owner. So if the manager rejects this request, obviously we're gonna reject. So we'll go right down to reject here. We'll attach that to there. We'll attach reject to end. So if the manager rejects this request, it's going to just reject. If the manager approves, it's going to go to the resource owner. The resource owner, if the resource owner rejects, it's going to go to reject. If the resource owner approves, it's going to go to approve. And then if it's approved, we're going to go to end. Now, we've now got two level approval, but if we want a manager's manager, so we need to go over here and get a manager's manager approval. So this is our escalation right here. So if we escalate from the manager's approval, we're going to go to the manager's manager. If the manager's manager rejects, we go to reject. If the manager's manager approves, we go to the resource owner and the resource owner then has to approve before it's approved. Right? So it's just, it's that easy to create a workflow in Savient. Now we'll save this, we'll give it a name, uh, escalated manager approval with resource owner approval. And then when we go to create the, the uh, request framework, we'll say this request requires the manager escalated to manager's manager with resource owner approval workflow, and that's it. And then you can reuse that workflow for any requirement where you require this type of two level with escalation type request uh, approval process. So very straightforward, very easy to do, designed to be business friendly so that business analysts can do these things rather than uh, requiring the assistance of a um, of a programmer. So I think the next thing that we want to go and look at here, let's back out of this if we can. Are we backing out? Back out. There we go. So I think the next thing that we want to look at is uh, certifications, which we call attestations. Um, I'm not sure which one we want here. So let's go look at see if we have a monthly one. We do not have a monthly one. All right, so let's just pick one from the list here and see what we have. Do, 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 do. Let's pick this one, not a service account review. Quarterly organization. Let's pick this one and see what it looks like. So one of the things that Savient does really well is make the certification process easy. And the way that we do that is we use our built-in risk analytics. So if we resume this certification here, I'll show you what we're gonna see. Let's look at quarterly access review. So one of the things that Savient does really well is to make the certification process easy. And we do that by using our risk analytics, which look for high risk entitlements and will help you to quickly approve low risk entitlements. 
So as with any certification, the first thing that we need to do is confirm that these people still work for us. So the certifier gets a list of the 14 or 15 people that he is certifying access for. He or she will then say, yes, all of these people work for me, or this person doesn't work for me anymore. So that goes back into the pool and someone else has to look at that. But once we've said, okay, yes, these people do work for us, we'll get right into the certification. So you can see up at the top that we have two high-risk accounts, we have six high-risk access, and what we've done is we've gone in and we've analyzed this access. So you'll see there are a large number of green thumbs here, and there are some red thumbs. When you're setting up this campaign, you can set it up to only certify high-risk or risky entitlements. So what that will do is that will take all of the enroll entitlements, so if the users are sales engineers, for example, as long as the entitlements are in the role sales engineer, they're probably okay. So you can go ahead and auto certify those. And then what we look at is the outliers. So we do peer analysis and we do outlier analysis and we look for things that stick out. And where you see the green thumbs here, these are entitlements that are not part of the role, but that more than 80% of the people in this group that we're certifying have access to or that are entitled to. And then the red thumbs are the ones that fewer than 20% of people have access to. So those are much higher risk. And what a large number of green thumbs here tells you is that you may actually need to look at adding these entitlements to the role. And I'm a perfect example of this. I am a sales engineer, so I'm in the sales engineer role. I have all of the entitlements that are normally attached to a sales engineer. But I'm also an administrator on our sales enablement platform and our learning management system. So when my manager, Jamie, goes in to do her certification, she'll see two red thumbs beside me, one for the LMS and one for the sales enablement platform. And she can say, yes, that's okay by clicking the yes button. She can click, uh, she can say, no, that's not okay by clicking the no button. She can uh, choose to consult with someone else. So in the case of the LMS and the, uh, the sales enablement platform, she would consult with Dave Culbertson, who is the owner of those two entitlements. And he would say, yes, we still want Hank to have those. So then Jamie would say, okay, we're going to approve those. Right? So the idea here is that we're eliminating all the low risk things. Uh, we do a smart certification that eliminates all the low risk so that the manager only needs to look at those things that are uh, out of role or out of the ordinary or that present an extremely high risk to the organization. So we're eliminating rubber stamping and making the process very, very streamlined. And then the last thing that I would like to show you about the platform is our control center. And what the control center is, is it is a single pane of glass view into what is going on in your Saviant deployment. And right now we're logged in as the EIC owner, which is the administrator. As we wait for this screen to paint out, there's a lot of stuff that it's trying to populate here. And once it's downloaded this information for the first time in your browser, it paints out very quickly. It's I, I did a, a clear of my cache and therefore all of this stuff needs to be redownloaded. So you look at this, what you can see here, and I'm sorry that I'm looking to the left, I'm looking at my bigger screen here. You can see that we have categories. So there are four categories on this, uh, on this uh, EIC owner uh, dashboard. And then we have six, uh, actually five, what we call books. And the books are a collection of KPIs, key performance indicators. So we have a book called users, we have a book called accounts, we have a book called entitlements and so on. And what these KPIs do is they give you a quick view into issues that you probably are going to want to deal with. So one of these is detected orphan accounts. And orphan accounts are a problem for every organization, right? They consume licenses, they sit out there unmanaged and untended, 
and they present a perfect opportunity for an attacker to gain access to credentials that no one will ever notice. So we need to get rid of those things. So if we click on this key performance indicator, what it will do is it will open the book, the user's book, or the accounts book, I can't remember which one, the accounts book. So it's opened the accounts book and put us onto the KPI for orphaned accounts. So here's a list of orphaned accounts and there's 49,000 or something of them. I can't remember what the exact number was, but there's a lot of them. This is atypical. Most organizations aren't gonna have 49,000 orphaned accounts, um, but this is demo data. So it, it happens here. Now, what's interesting about our reports is that it isn't just a report. It isn't just a, here's something that's wrong and you have to go out and find it. We actually give you the ability to deal with these things immediately right here. So you can accept this and put a note on it. You can reject it and put a note on it and it will be deprovisioned. You can, uh, so we can leave it open, we can accept it, we can revoke it, or we can set it for further review. And what that does is that lets us send it to someone else and say, hey, is this account supposed to be here? Should we get rid of it? So our reports and all of our reports here give you the ability to take action immediately. So these things, as soon as you discover them, you can go and you can deal with them, right? And the control center, there's a lot of information here. Let's go back to the control center home here. And like everything else in Savient, this is persona based. So where we're logged in as the IGA owner here, we see one thing. If we look at um, a compliance manager, you'll see that we see different categories with different books, with different information in them. And all of this stuff is configurable. Everything in our UI is configurable. If you don't like the name of a tile, you can change it. If you don't like uh, what one of these key performance indicators is called, you can change it. You can change the layout. You can change what's included. It's all fully configurable to make it fit exactly what you want it to look like, right? It is um, a, a very flexible, very business-friendly platform, right? And that is the end for now of a very quick look at what is a very uh, involved platform. There's a, an awful lot here uh, that I haven't been able to show you in a half hour. I would love the opportunity to uh, get together with you and take a deeper dive into this to address your specific use cases, to answer any of your specific questions. So right now, what we're going to do we're going to go to uh, uh, a few minutes of questions. Um, and unfortunately, I have a conflict and need to jump off of this call. But uh, Francis Mongrain, who is our sales director, uh, who is based in Montreal, will be on the call. And Helgo, one of the other sales engineers, will also be here. And they will be happy to take your questions. And uh, if you're interested in taking another look uh, or a deeper look at Savient, please feel free to uh, let one of them know or stop by and, and visit with Francis or contact him. Um, and, and we'd uh, love to talk to you. So uh, that's it for me today. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks, Hank. Uh, this was very interesting. Uh, sadly enough, uh, can, uh, Hank could not stay for the Q&A. So we have uh, with us uh, Elgo, uh, who's a sales engineer also, and we also have Francis with us. Uh, both of them are able to answer, uh, answer the questions in French or in English. So we are able to uh, keep on going with this thing. So uh, let's look at the question that we have. Um, first question we got is, uh, how can you guarantee that our information won't leave Canada? if you're a cloud-based solution? Uh, I can answer and go to that one. It's very similar to the one we received during my presentation. We, uh, When we work with a client, we choose where he wants us to put the, uh, the information. So if you take AWS or Azure, they have multiple region uh, service offers, sorry, in multiple regions in Canada. So we guarantee that the, the data will not leave Canada. Okay, cool. Uh, what else we have? Um, we also have, uh, Hank mentioned that you can support partners and customers 
Does that mean that we could use Savian for our employees and our partners' employees uh, and for our customers in the same instance? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So yeah, that's correct. You can, uh, that's a very good question, by the way. And yes, you can. So usually when you do IGA uh, or in our space, you think about managing employee mostly. But what we've done is that with our third party access uh, uh, governance platform, we are able now to manage not only the employees, but you can go beyond and manage your customers and your contractors as well. And those create some very interesting use cases where you can leverage all the all the good thing that our platform is bringing. Okay, thanks. That's interesting. Uh, third one, we have also, you mentioned PAM a couple of times. I thought that Savian was an IGA service provider. Does your PAM module replace a dedicated PAM solution uh, might well be using? I can take that one as well. So the, the PAM, so what we've done is that we've introduced, and we're the first one in the industry here to introduce this Converge platform where we have multiple modules uh, or multiple products really available on our platform that can leverage all the different components. And one of the module is spam. So while a lot of uh, existing vendors, existing customers may already have a PAM solution, we can work with the PAM solution that they have, or we can provide our own, which is extremely competitive in the market. And it also allows us, because it's on the same platform, to come up with uh, unique use cases such as just-in-time provisioning. So when you request a privileged access, that access may actually not exist, but because we can provision it, we're gonna provision it when you need it, then you use it, and then we can remove it. So we have the best of both worlds where you can have, you know, the privileged access management is, 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 is managed, and then you have the IGA on top. So I guess that would make a lot of cost saving on when you're paying admin on a SaaS provider, for example. Uh, that's one way to look at it. You definitely got a lot of cost saving with us and with our Converge platform. That's for sure. Yes. Oh, and that's interesting. Also very interesting. I've got another, uh, uh, another question here. I know that in the previous session, you were talking about the integrations, how easy it was to integrate your platform with uh, all type of solutions. So I've got a question here that's asking about the integration with Azure, uh, for example, and uh, other SSO application. Do you have any uh, info regarding this? Yes. So Azure. So first of all, Azure means a lot of things, right? A lot yeah. of Azure it could be a. Could it's be a humongous. Software. It could be the, the Azure platform. It could be a Active Directory. And no matter how you look at Azure, we can integrate with all of those. So we be able to integrate with, you know, your typical Azure AD. So we manage the users in there. We can we can integrate with your Azure SaaS solution. Uh, no. Uh, uh, I, infrastructure as a service where we will be able to detect your workload and and have insight on how the configuration are done so we can do that um, and uh, yes and in terms of how easy it is to integrate with other products uh, we have a long list of connectors and a lot of experience having integrated with all, a lot of different uh, system and actually like one of my part uh, my colleagues says he hasn't heard and I haven't heard of any system that we haven't been able to connect to and manage the users uh, in one way or another. Well, thank you very much. And anyway, uh, as the director of the uh, security practice at Naropro, I'm very happy to have you as a, my, my partners. So, uh, and so it's a very, uh, I really believe in the solutions that you have as a GIA, so uh, very interesting. So uh, we only have a couple of seconds left. Uh, so I wanna thank you for your, uh, for your uh, sessions, your time, and everybody that uh, listened to this session, I hope that you find the information that you uh, wanted. And again, if you have questions or inf more information you require, go to uh, Savian Boot. They'll be happy to uh, to answer you or come to our boot and then we'll, uh, we'll also be there for you. So thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Roger, and thank you for, for the comment. It's really appreciated and we look forward to work with you and your team as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Bye -bye.